Professor Chess videos. I'm just up on the sunrise again where the lovely place I'm in is quiet, nice and peaceful. Great opportunity to make another chess video. I've been studying various Grandmaster games because Jeremy Silman in his chess course, the one I'm studying, has advised us to seriously make a detailed attempted work through the Grandmaster games. This particular Grandmaster game that I'm about to show you is a very, it's somewhat of a short game, but it's an important game. This one is by Aaron Nimzovich in 1927 in Keksmet, and he's playing an opponent named Gilg. I don't know how well known this is. This is in his book, The Praxis of My System, a very, very important chess book. Uh, Tigran Petrosian was one of the big fans of Aaron Nimzovich's style of play, which was usually a slow, hard, trench warfare type of chess. This particular game is pretty quick because Nimzovich makes fast work of this, but it's very interesting to see how he does. Nimzovich is the white, Gilg is the, uh, is the black pieces. Nimzovich pushes his c3 pawn up because, of course, he's going to want to bring up this pawn d4. And the effect of Nimzovich going to the center is extremely interesting in this game, and that's what I want to show you, as well as, as how, because of the way he played, how he worked his pieces, which is exactly how Silman in his chess course says they did. And so this is interesting. Uh, Gilg brought his queen up and he said, well, I don't think that was the best response. I think he should have brought the d6 pawn up to strengthen the center. But he didn't yet, so he puts the question to Nimzovich's bishop. Nimzovich keeps this diagonal, keeps the pressure on the knight. Gilg continues bringing out his development, trying to equalize. Now Nimzovich brings the queen out. And Gilg comes straight up the center. Now this is interesting because, and then they both, of course, they want to castle early. It's always a good idea to try to get your play to castle early because there's usually going to be a battle here. You can see something here. One of the lessons is how to read the chessboard, right? Now, when we look at this position at this point, and it's only up to move 8, it's very interesting what we see, isn't it? Development seems to be somewhat even, doesn't it, at this point? Nobody really has an advantage in space, either in the center. It's obvious they're both playing in the center, though, isn't it? Other than the small wing pawn move and the uh, bishop move, actually all the action appears to me to be in the center. And nobody has space, the material is even, etc. But you can see what they're playing for by looking at what their pieces are pointing at. This is a very interesting concept that Jeremy Silman teaches us in his chess course. Gilg has laid claim to d4, here, here, and here, right? Nimzovich has brought out his pawn. He has his knight. He also has his pawn here pointing to d4. I pointed to this pawn. I meant this pawn to d4, but Nimzovich is also taken over the d5, even though the knight is also contesting d5. It appears to me at this point that the square d4 and d5 is what these guys are after, doesn't it? And in fact, because of being able to look at the chessboard and see where the pawns are pointing, and to see how the knights have been set up, they're going to fight this square, aren't they? That's kind of cool to be able to read the chessboard in this manner. And sure enough, Nimzovich does fight for that square. 
Now this is a fascinating thing because most of us, lesser mortals, we would recognize, well, he's got the square covered once, twice, three times, and Nimzovich only has the square once, twice. Isn't that interesting? So, he's, is Nimzovich going to lose the central battle? Why would he push his pawn there? Let's see. It's a very interesting logic that Nimzovich displays here. Gilg takes his C pawn and takes that D4. No question about it, he says. And Nimzovich takes his C pawn and takes the D4. Now the knight comes down and takes that D4. Now see, you can see it appears at this point that Gilg is going to win this battle for the center, right? Well, Nimzovich has his knight covering that D4. And Gilg has his pawn, his E pawn, covering that D4. And Gilg is the one who ends up occupying D4. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? What essentially Nimzovich did, one of his favorite themes, is called liquidation. He virtually liquidated the center. And there's a reason why he wanted to do this. Now, what does this tell us when we read the chessboard? And, and, and in fact, let me, uh, let me continue on with the next two moves, and it will really show you what they're trying to do. Nimzovich goes ahead and pushes the pawn to e5, so he's pushing beyond the center with his pawn, putting the question to the knight, right? Well, Gild, <laughs> he pushes his pawn to d3. It's a passed pawn. It's almost in right now, isn't it? And he's putting the question to Nimzovich's queen. So what does this type of a board tell us? When we explore, when we read the board, we see that it's got an open center, don't we? There's very few pawns here. And it looks like the pawns that are there are going to disappear. And what does an open board tell us? Right? Bishops love open boards. See, they're the hot rods of the chessboard. They like the long, wide, beautiful, all the way across diagonals. They can use their influence when there's not a lot of clutter in the middle of the board. And right now, there's not a lot of clutter. So this board favors bishops, right? It makes logical, simple sense once you understand each one of the pieces, doesn't it? It's kind of fun. And I, I know, I probably overemphasize that. But in the process of training so that when we get to a tournament or when we get to chess club, if we have these ideas constantly drilled and we practice these and we do our chess exercises by studying the Grandmaster's games, it becomes automatic for us. And that's what we want to get to. We want to be able to see the chessboard and not wonder well, what do I do next? Because that's when you start making mistakes. That's when you start playing weaker chess. Because of our knowledge at this point that bishops love open chess boards, we know the bishops are going to be a prominent part in this game, don't we? Sincerely, we already know that. If you're white, you're going to want to put your bishops out there. If you're black, you're going to want to put your bishops out there. There are now open files, soon to be open files. That's where we put our rooks because they too like an open chessboard, don't they? See, this type of information is invaluable to constantly practice in your own games and look for in the Grandmaster games. I know, I know. Shut up and get on with it. Okay. The queen doesn't take the pawn. It comes up to e3. 
The knight comes over here to d5, of course, asking Nimzovich, what are you going to do with your little lady, dude? So now we're getting back to the center. Isn't, isn't that interesting? Well, he hops over here to g3. Notice his placement of his queen here. He didn't put his queen back. He didn't move her back to d2 to cover that passed pawn. He doesn't need to. That pawn's not going anywhere. We, we know that. He's not going to go here. We've, we've got this place covered, right? We've got the rook on the 8th rank and all that. He keeps the queen out in the field developed, and he supports his pawn, and he's pointing to the queen, right? There's no reason to give up that pawn if you don't have to, right? Gilg presses his pawn to g6. Bishop goes down to b3. Now, here we begin to see the strategy. Bishop to b3 because he has a nice slice right over to the king side. Right? He has a nice approach right to the king side. Right? Yeah. Very interesting. Now, the knight pops over here to b4. And watch. Pay attention here. This is important. And I'm not criticizing another grandmaster. I'm, I'm not in these guys' level. But based on what I've been learning so far, he has not castled. He certainly hasn't developed, he hasn't pushed central pawns and brought his bishop out. He appears to me to be leaving himself undeveloped too much to go prancing around with his single piece. You can't win a chess game playing a single piece over and over and over again. He's looking for a quick combination move somehow. He's got this past pawn, so he thinks he's going to do something really cool by putting his knight here and taking the rook. But in the process, he has moved the knight how many times? Four, five. He's moved the pawn how many times? One, two, three. You know, he's consumed eight moves in order to get a one-piece, quick-shot attack. You see that? Because of the way he's playing, Nimzovich has developed a stronger board. Because while he's monkeying around with the knight, Nimzovich is putting together an entire attack. You see that? And, and it's not up to me to criticize another grandmaster because I'm so far below these guys. Based on what I know, I think that's what I'm seeing here, though. Right? And it's going to cost him. Watch what Nimzovich does. Bishop takes f7. Pow! I mean, wowie! Zip! The f7 pawn, as well as the f2 pawn, is the weakest pawn on the board in the opening because only the king covers that pawn, right? We all knew that. Well, that's a weakness. And Gilg has been trying, he, he's decided he's going to cash in already with that pass pawn, and he's going to use that pass pawn to really do a cool combination to get himself a mere rook. So while he's monkeying around, Nimzovich is going to take it to him. He's not castled. Oops. So Nimzovich is going for him. This is correct strategy, right? And you go, holy cow. Why would you do that? You're going to give him a bishop? Heaven, yes, you're going to give him a bishop. Are you kidding me? That king can't take that bishop and stay safe. This game is going to be over immediately if he does. So, the king has no choice but to go to d8. Now, what do you think Nimzovich is going to do? Based on what I've told you when we explore this chessboard, 
He's got this covered really well. He's deep in his territory. He's got a pawn here that can come up. He's got his queen on this side. She can pop up here and, and do something. But watch what Nimzovich does. He also has an open diagonal here that he pulls that bishop right up there to h6. Pow! He not only is restricting this wing, right? He's also got this covered. He's got this covered. He's cornered the king. Now you're beginning to see the faulty strategy of Gilg just doing a one-piece quick maneuver. The board being open, more or less, screams out that we use our bishops because bishops like open boards. Nimzovich is using this to great effect, isn't he? This is very instructive. <laughs> this is something we want to pay attention to. Now, of course, Gilg triumphantly marches into C2 with his might. I'm going to win. Gilg doesn't have a prayer because of the way he's played this game. He's left half his army home. And you say, well, so has Nimzovich. That's true. Nimzovich has at this point, but... He has utilized the concept of an open board says to use your bishops. It's obvious that Nimzovich's bishops are vastly superior to Gilg's bishops in this instance, right? That should be obvious. Honest. <laughs> well, Nimzovich pulls out his knight. And notice what Gilg does. Gilg sees it too late. He says, oh, wait a sec. <laughs> I do have to pull my knight back out here. I'm not going to take that rook right now because there's something else afoot that, uh, that I wasn't paying attention to. Well, the queen comes over here and nabs the passed pawn. And now you can see Nimzovich completely overwhelming Gilg, can't you? It's a foregone conclusion. Well, the queen has to enter into the game and try to take away that central pawn. And now, once again, you can see that the center battle is raging here. Each piece is trying to protect its center and attack its center, etc. So the pawns are gone. The problem is Nimzovich has a huge lead in development and a powerful placed series of pieces, as opposed to Gilg, who only has two powerful pieces. This is all the difference in the chess game. Well, Nimzovich pulls up the power. Now, he also has an open file. You can see he's pinning his queen to the bishop, of course, Gilg isn't going to leave his queen there. He'd rather lose the bishop if he so desires. Queen comes back here to f6. As good a move as you can make at this point. He figures, well, I have to at least put pressure on the bishop. And now, of course, rook does take that bishop. Rook takes e7, absolutely. And here, black resigned. You can see how Nimzovich systematically uses the open chessboard as well as the center to build up an irresistible attack. And when you look at this, you go, well, why did, why did Black resign? Because quite frankly, if the king takes e7, I mean, you've got a rook, right? The problem is now the knight comes up here to d5, check. Ouch. <laughs> you put the king in check and you've got a queen. You see the price of underdevelopment, right? On the other hand, Nimzovich also points out, if the queen takes e7, then he's got queen takes d4. Ugh if I can do that. And of course, 
the game is lost. You say, how is it lost? Now the queen can come to here and take the bishop, and now you've got your rook. Check. <laughs> See, and, and then, yeah, yeah, it just gets uglier and uglier from there. So the lesson here is extremely fun to see. Number one, Nimzovich saw a way to liquidate the center of its pawns and immediately make use of the hot rods of the chessboard, his bishops. And they worked beautifully, didn't they? Gilg was more worried about doing a one-piece maneuver over the course of, say, how many moves did it take him? Six, seven, eight? In the meantime, Nimzovich had popped his bishops into effect, and once he grabs an open file, then the attack is on and it's overwhelmingly powerful. <laughs> that is fun to see in action how reading the chessboard really does make a difference. This is a true story. <laughs> fun to know, isn't it? So that's the idea that I wanted to share with you today from Aaron Nimzovich. So thanks for watching my Backyard Professor Chess videos. They're a lot of fun to make. I, I enjoy all your comments. I enjoy you guys seeing moves that I miss or giving me another option and all. That's fun to explore it together, isn't it? So keep your comments coming. Happy checkmating. Happy chess studying and learning. Jump onto the Grandmaster Games. They're excellent teaching materials. And I will see you in the next chess video.